Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to see everyone on this day the Lord has made as we get to be together and to join in praising God as one family together. Let's continue this time of worship with prayer. Loving God, we thank you for your presence among us. We thank you for your rain and for the sunlight and for the light that we see in the faces of one another that gives us a glimpse of your love and your glory. We ask that you would move among us in this time of worship, that your spirit would touch us anew and would form us more fully into the people you have made us and called us to be. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. We're uh, happy to have you here worshiping with us. Uh, a few announcements to uh, draw your attention to in the bulletin. Uh, we have a busy uh, week ahead, and you'll see um, tonight we have a confirmation uh, class here. So uh, please, and we can continue this when we do prayers later, but keep uh, the nine people from Bethel, Lawrence Chapel, Mount, and Mount Zion that are uh, going through confirmation. And tonight it'll be 5 to 6.30 here at our church. Um, upcoming meetings, February 28th at 6.30 is the Centennial Celebration Planning Meeting. And then March 7th at 5.30 is the Finance Committee Meeting. And you can uh, find the information, the Zoom information in your bulletin about that. Um, Ash Wednesday is March 2nd. So uh, for those of you that have joined us at Lawrence Chapel before for that, um, it's a, a very nice time. If you haven't, please join us uh, March 2nd. Uh, 5.30 will be the pancake supper, and then 7 o'clock is the service. So um, 5.30, you don't have to be there right at 5.30, but if you get there at 5.30, you'll have more time to fellowship with, with our friends um, from all the other churches, too. So I uh, look forward to seeing everyone then and enjoying some of the Martin's famous pancakes. So if you haven't had those, please join us then, or you can join us for our pancake breakfast and blood drive on March 6th. Preferably you do both of those, and that's at 8.30, and um, an email went out earlier this week, and then you can find it on Facebook also, but sign up for the blood drive. You can sign up ahead of time. Um, if you do not want to do that online and you want me to sign you up, please see me after the service, and I'll sign you up for a spot uh, for the blood drive. The United Methodist Women will meet at the church uh, March 2nd at 2.30. And then March 13th is the baseball game that all children, youth, and their parents are invited to attend. Um, if you have not uh, reserved a spot, please uh, let uh, Beth Oman or you can let me know or let Jonathan know or Zechariah know so we can get you on that list. And I think Phil has an announcement. Or, yes. All right. Sure. Thank you. Um, and if, if you're not aware, if you have not picked up a book yet, there are books at the back of the church for a reshape and um, every, we, we purchase them for every family, so please, uh, please take a book so you can uh, follow along and read uh, prior to the groups. And again, there's seven groups, 
And when we were uh, discussing this, I don't know when we made the decision to do this was a while ago. It seems like years ago. But uh, <laughs> one of the one of the big draws to this program and another one we were looking at was that this had the opportunity for us to have small groups uh, to get people uh, together in the church and um, and and you know study together and grow together. And so that was very appealing to us. And so so again. I encourage you to join one of these uh, small groups and sign up. You sign up with the insert or, or reach out to someone to get in one of the groups. So it should be a, a fun time for us as we grow as a church. Do we have any other announcements? Is that right? Thank you, Zachariah. So for those at home, we're uh, the youth and the children are having a competition for donations to Clemson Community Care uh, toiletry supplies. And I guess they bring those here to church. They yeah, bring those here to church. And, um, and is, so is it the youth versus the children? And then, but you lose either way, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. So we, we all win. So Zachariah will take a pot of the face or eggs something with eggs i don't know but <laughs> all right any uh, other announcements all right please join me for the prayer of confession found in your bulletin oh god you have made us to be the body of christ the very presence of jesus in this world far too often we confess we fail to see or live up to this lofty calling. Forgive us, we pray. Remind us once more through your grace who we are, so that we might be the visible presence of Jesus in this world. Amen. Good morning. Join me in today's responsive reading, Psalm 99, which can be found in your hymnal on page 819. You will read the bold. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. The Lord sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, and is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and wondrous name. Holy is the Lord. Mighty ruler, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship of the Lord's footstool. Glory is the Lord. Moses and Aaron were among God's priests. Samuel also was among those who called on God's name. They cried to the Lord, who answered him, who spoke to him in the pillar of fire. They kept God's testimonies and the sta statutes God gave them. O oh Lord our God, you answered them. You were a king of God to them, the adventure of their own peoples. Exalt the word of God and worship at his holy mount. Surely the Lord our God is holy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please stand as you are able as we reaffirm our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite the children up for a special children's time with Zechariah. Good morning. <laughs> it's great to have such a big group this morning. Well, I'm looking at the bulletin right now for today, and it looks like we're going to finish a series today called At the Feet of Jesus. That's what it says right here. What do you think it means to be at the feet of Jesus? Because when I think about feet a lot of times, they're kind of stinky sometimes. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to smell that. So what do you think? I see Holly's got her hand up. Maybe when you're bowing, yeah. Maybe sometimes when we bow down to Jesus, that that is when we're at his feet. That's a good example. What else might it mean to sit down at the feet of Jesus? What is something that you might do when you're sitting down and someone's kind of talking to you? Yeah. Yeah, you might be looking at them. And why might you be looking and paying attention to them? Their face? Yeah. Why? Why, why would you maybe be <laughs> talking? And they might be, maybe Jesus would be teaching us. And that's a time when you, maybe when you sit down to listen to him. And that's kind of what we mean by at the feet of Jesus, spending time with Jesus and learning from him. What are some reasons that we would want to learn from Jesus? What do you think? I mean, so is Jesus actually here with us right now, or we can actually go and sit at his feet? Not quite. So maybe that's not, it doesn't mean literally at his feet. But what are some ways that we can learn from Jesus? Yeah, Gabby. Reading the Bible. That's a great way. Jesus' words are in the Bible and the words that the Holy Spirit inspires. Were you putting your hand up, Caitlin? Praying. That's a great way to talk to Jesus and spend time with him. Yeah. Sometimes we have to wait, maybe even wait a long time to hear Jesus' answer, but he always answers. That's really good. And when Jesus wants us to learn from him, and what do you think, why do you think Jesus would want us to learn from him? Do you think that when we, once we learn, he wants us to keep that information, that knowledge to ourselves? That's right. He wants us to share with other people. And that's a great reason that we can sit at Jesus' feet. When you learn, who are some people who you can tell about what you learned from reading the Bible or from Sunday school? You can tell your dad. Yeah, that's great to talk to your family about what you learned. <laughs> and me. That's great. What about, Holly, were you going to say something? Your friends. That's an awesome one. Because sometimes your friends might not have learned the same thing as you in Sunday school. If they go to another Sunday school, maybe they could share with you. Or if they don't go to one, then they might learn things for the very first time. That's really good. Your grandparents, that's an awesome one. Anytime you can share with trusted adults what you learned, that's a great time to talk and learn with them too. So I think it's really cool to get to sit at the feet of Jesus and to talk to him. Do you guys think you can help me lead the congregation in talking to Jesus with the Lord's Prayer? All right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. We move into a time of prayer together. We certainly want to praise God for the gift of music and the ways that we can share our gifts with one another. I uh, also want to just praise God for these beautiful flowers and thank uh, Angie for sharing those with us today. And um, kind of piggybacking just another praise on what Phil and Sharon and Benji had shared with Reshape. I know a lot of hands and uh, time and energy have gone into making that process happen. I just wanted to praise God that we did have um, a family who thought it was so important that everybody have a chance to participate, that they bought and paid for all the books <laughs> for everybody so that cost wouldn't be a, um, a barrier to participation. So um, just praise God for all of those many things. Do we have other praises or prayers to share this morning as we gather together? Not all at once. Yeah, Bonnie. Uh, okay, you said the woman, his name was Bobby Trailer. Okay. So for uh, the family of Bobby Trailer who passed away this week. Yes, um, the situation in the Ukraine, obviously, um, prayers for everyone whose lives are being impacted by that right now and for whatever solutions look like for that situation. Any other prayers or praises today? If not, let's join our hearts in a time of prayer. Loving God, we thank you for your presence in our lives and in our world. We know that sometimes there are things going on that are so big and so large that it can feel as though we are helpless to do anything about it. 
but we know that we can entrust everything to you and that you will often use us and use others to be the very answers to our prayers collectively. So God, this week we especially lift up all those whose lives are being impacted by war in the Ukraine as we see images of pain and suffering and violence. We just ask that you would hasten that day when weapons would be beaten into plowshares and there would be war no more, as Isaiah prophesied. We ask that you would bring comfort and help us to be people who bring comfort to those who are hurting and in need, whether they are on the other side of the world or they are in our own backyard. God, we lift up the family of Bobby Trailer and all those families who grieve the loss of loved ones. We ask that you would bring them peace and comfort and that you would even use us to be that visible sign of your love and comfort and compassion that they can see. God, we just thank you and lift up all those praises that we have for those signs of your beauty and your world for those signs of your generosity through the generosity and care of others. We thank you for the gift of music and for just the voices that we have with which to praise you and to sing your praises. God, we lift up those other needs that might be on our hearts that we have not spoken out loud, but that you know. We lift up praises for uh, Kathy and Tommy Stills' great nephew who was healthy, Rio, who was born yesterday, and for his health and for the mom's health. We lift up those other needs that we hold in our hearts and ask that you would just pour out your love and grace in each of those situations, that others would come to know your love through your love and grace. We thank you and we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to please stand as you are able as we hear the gospel reading for today, which comes from Luke chapter 9. This is a story that is typically called the Transfiguration. It's a story that we hear every year before the season of Lent, which begins this Wednesday and leads all the way up through Easter. Hear now these words from Luke chapter 9. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed him, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son. My chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let us pray. Loving God, we ask that as we... Meditate on your scriptures and your word is proclaimed that you would help us to hear with joy what you say to us this very day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you had to name the top two most breathtaking views you have ever seen in your entire life, what would those be? You don't have to say them out loud, but, but just think. Maybe it's somewhere at the mountains or looking out at the ocean or a sunset or something that was just amazing and beautiful that is etched in your memory forever because it was so different from anything you've seen before. 
I know one of those views that I think of came when I was on a flight a number of years ago from Chicago to Los Angeles. Not a place where you would think you would see a beautiful view, right, on an airplane. But as I was listening to music or reading a book or watching the in-flight movie, I think they just kept playing Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon over and over and over again. Out of the blue, I heard somebody behind me just say, whoa. And I had a window seat. And so I looked out my window and saw the most majestic view of the Rocky Mountains. Snow-capped, purple, stretching as far as the eye could see. There were no words. <laughs> and then a few moments later, still staring out the window thinking, okay, that was pretty cool. Let's see if it can happen again. We passed over the Grand Canyon. And again, just stood staring out the window at this thing that had taken millions and millions of years for God to create with no tools other than water and wind. It was breathtaking. Another view that comes to mind from my top two is a very different one, but that is probably the first time I looked at one of my children after Marissa and I became parents for the first time. I remember standing in this room in the maternity section at Emory Midtown Hospital and there were all kinds of things that were amazing about that hospital. If you, if you went in the bathroom, it had a sensor that would automatically open the door, right? And, and all the automatic things. But there was nothing more amazing than standing there in that room and staring at this beautiful child and looking at how peaceful he was as he slept. Looking at how long his eyelashes were, even then. And just being amazed that somehow this person who had at one point not even ever existed had almost just magically appeared and now I was getting to hold him in my arms. It was amazing. Now I want you to notice what I didn't do in those two situations and probably what you didn't do in those times that you have in your mind of those breathtaking views that you've seen. As we were flying over the Rocky Mountains, I did not immediately ruin the moment by pulling out my phone and taking a bunch of pictures that could not do the, the view justice. Luckily for me, um, that was back in the days before everybody's phone had a camera on it, so I just got to stare and be in the moment. I didn't look away from that window so that I could pick up a, a travel guide and start planning my vacation to the Rocky Mountains or to the Grand Canyon. I just stared and took it all in. When I held my child for the first time, I didn't say, okay, that was great. Now let me get a bunch of diapers ready because he's going to need these. I didn't put him down and pick up my phone and say, okay, let's start planning for his college education. There would be a time for that. But at that time, all that was required was to be present in that moment and to pause and to take it all in. As Christians have read the Bible for nearly 20 centuries now, a typical pattern that Christians have followed is they read something in the Bible or they experience uh, uh, you know, some kind of experience of God and then ask the question, okay, so what? So Jesus did this, so what does that mean I should do in response? Or Mary did this, and so how does that impact my life? Or Peter, or Paul, or Moses, or someone else said this, or did this, or I experienced God in this way. So what does that mean for how we should be the church? So what is a really important question. It's how our lives become shaped by the witness of Scripture and by the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. It's an important question for us as the church to ask. And yet, friends, there are times when we don't need to ask, so what? We just need to experience the wonder and the awe and take it all in and just pause and, and, and be in that moment. And friends, the story that's known as the Transfiguration is one of those moments. In that story, in case you missed it, Jesus and a few of his best buddies had gone up on a mountain to pray together. Up to that point in his ministry, they had experienced Jesus as a teacher and as a healer, things that are a pretty big deal. But when they were up on that mountain, all of a sudden, Jesus' clothes and his face began shining 
brighter than anyone could ever bleach anything. And they heard the voice of God, and they saw Moses and Elijah, two heroes of the Hebrew faith, standing with Jesus. It was an amazing moment, something far bigger than even seeing the Grand Canyon from 35,000 feet above or holding your child for the first time. And then one of Jesus' followers opened his mouth and kind of ruined the moment. Peter, the guy who would always say what everyone else was thinking but was afraid to say, saw how amazing it was and decided we need to do something in response to this. If it had happened today, Peter probably would have taken out his phone and started just snapping as many pictures as he could or or live streaming it on Facebook. Or maybe uh, Peter would have started writing about it and he would have pulled out his laptop and just started typing away about everything he had seen, choosing to stare into the dim glow of a computer screen rather than looking at the bright, overwhelming glow of the Savior of the universe who was right there in front of him. Since Peter didn't live today, though, he instead said this. He said, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In other words, Jesus, this is so great that instead of enjoying this, I think we should do three home improvement projects right now. Things that we could do any other time. Incidentally, Peter, in trying to preserve that moment, wanted to get busy doing things that would have taken him right away from that moment that he wanted to preserve. I sometimes wonder how many moments there are like that that we miss because we don't pause to take them in or we rush to immediately do something in response to whatever it is we've seen or experienced. There are these uh, pictures, you can look them up, not right now, but on the internet, uh, they're fascinating pictures that were taken at famous tourist spots, like in the early 2000s, And then within the past two or three years, the same spot, just like 15 or 20 years apart. And in the pictures from the early 2000s, you see people smiling and laughing. And you can see they are completely just enraptured with whatever it is that's happening in front of them. In the pictures from the last two or three years, same location, nobody's laughing, nobody's smiling. They're all just staring blankly into their phones while they all photograph or videotape whatever it is that's happening. Which group of people do you think is actually going to remember that experience better? But I wonder how many times have we missed those breathtaking moments because we're busy or we're distracted or we're so busy fumbling to get our phone out of our pocket that by the time we get it out and can take a picture, the the sunset has already dimmed, or some strangers have already walked into the camera shot and ruined it. More importantly, how many times has Christ, the Savior of the universe, the Messiah, the one through whom all things came into being, been present right there with us? And you missed it because you were too busy or distracted. You were caught up maybe in cares that seemed really important, but that that did not hold a candle to the Savior of the universe who was right there, present with you. Maybe you sensed Christ's presence with you in a powerful way, but you did like Peter. You felt like you had to immediately do something in response, and so in trying to respond, you missed getting to just pause and experience the glory of Jesus and that awareness that he was with you in a powerful way. Christ shows up in our lives in powerful ways. But I think sometimes we miss it. And friends, here's why it's important, I think, to look for the presence of Christ in our lives and to pause and be fully present whenever we sense that he is with us. Because, friends, I don't know about you, but those moments when we are powerfully aware of Jesus being right there with us in a powerful way, that doesn't happen very often. There's a reason why things are called extraordinary, right? They aren't ordinary. They aren't typical. How many times have I held my child for the very first time in my life? Twice. How many times have I flown over the Grand Canyon and the Rocky Mountains on the same day from 35,000 feet above? Once. 
How many times have you experienced whatever it is you had in your mind as a breathtaking view? Probably not many, otherwise it wouldn't take your breath away. Friends, in, in the Gospel of Luke, there are 24 chapters. And in those chapters are dozens and dozens and dozens of stories. How many of those stories are of people being completely just in awe and wonder of the glory of Jesus Christ? Two? Three? Maybe four? The transfiguration, maybe Jesus' resurrection appearances, maybe one or two around the time of his birth? But that's probably it. How many of those stories are about the ordinary? Or people going through challenges? People getting sick and recovering, or maybe not? People sharing meals together, people traveling, people waiting, people being taught. Like all the rest of them, right? <laughs> there are this many stories where people are in awe and wonder of the glory of Christ, and a bunch more where people are just living their lives, going through struggles and challenges and joys that are nowhere near as grand as the transfiguration. And friends, if that is the ratio of those events in a book, Luke, that was written to communicate the glory and the awe and wonder of Christ, then how much more is that the ratio of our lives day to day? The life of a typical Christian is not filled with a constant, overwhelming, extraordinary awareness of Jesus' glory and goodness. Like the people in Luke's gospel, our lives are filled with all kinds of moments that are ordinary and challenging and sometimes just forgettable. They are filled with meals that we can't even remember we ate 24 hours later. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. And that was, what, four, three, four hours ago. They are filled with work days and school days that aren't all that different from one another and that likely run all together in our minds. Our lives are filled with illnesses and appointments and extracurricular activities like practices and concerts and games that we can't even remember the results of for very long after that. There are certainly joys that we experience hopefully every day, but not the kinds of joys that we would call mountaintop experiences, because again, if something's extraordinary, then it means it doesn't happen all the time. And friends, it's precisely because those moments are so rare, those beautiful views or those experiences that Christ is right with us and next to us, working in a powerful way, that hanging on to and remembering those moments and looking for them when they come is so important. The memory of those moments and the anticipation that God will bring those kinds of things again is what gives us faith and strength and energy to move through the ordinary and the challenging and the difficult. The, the Gospel of Luke names three people who were with Jesus on that day, Peter, James, and John, who saw what happened. And just to recap the rest of their stories, they would end up all going through some really tough things. They would go on to see Jesus betrayed and arrested and crucified. Even after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, those three were part of a very small group of people who would then take on the mission that Jesus had entrusted to them and, and spread what would go on to become the early church. James would go on eventually to be executed by King Herod. Peter, tradition holds, would end up also being martyred for his faith, asking to be crucified upside down because he said he was not worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus Christ. John, tradition holds, would go on to live a very long life, but tradition still holds that he was exiled at one point uh, to an island by himself, um, during a, a period of harsh persecution of the church. Where did those three people find the strength and the faith to continue on through all of the difficult and challenging times that would come their way after Jesus commissioned them to be his church? Well, I have to believe it was their memory of what happened that day up on the mountaintop when they saw Jesus in all of his glory. They had experienced awe and wonder that was so impossible to put into words that Luke even says that in that time they didn't tell anybody about what they had seen. Whenever they got discouraged and wondered if leaving everything behind to follow this teacher had been the smartest decision they could have made, they could look back on that time on the mountaintop with Jesus 
and remember the glory that they had seen and know that he was not just a teacher who they had chosen to follow, but that he was the savior of the world. When Jesus had ascended into heaven and they could no longer see him face to face, Zechariah was talking today about how we don't get to literally sit at Jesus' feet, right? We can't see Jesus in front of us. And maybe they didn't feel like they were making any progress on what Jesus had entrusted to them. They could look back on that moment. And they could remember that just as Jesus had been powerfully present in their lives up on the mountaintop that day, that Jesus was just as present with them in those times, even when they could not see him, and even if they wished they could. When other, whenever other people ridiculed them and, and threatened them in response to their faith, they could be comforted and strengthened by the memory that that day on the mountaintop, it was made clear to them that they were participating in something that the Lord of the universe had called them into. They were part of something that was bigger than just a teacher. And friends, the same is true for every single one of us today. I remember about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, the church um, that we were part of at that time, uh, one of the Sunday school classes had gone out to a fellowship meal uh, at this really good Mexican restaurant outside of Atlanta where we were living at the time. And there was one person there who was not only new to that church, he was new really to going to church at all. And I knew he had all kinds of questions. You could always see the wheels just turning in his head about, all right, I got to figure this out. This is weird what they're doing. What's going on? And at the end of the meal, he finally got around to asking me the question he'd just been sitting on the whole time. And he kind of, you could tell he was wondering, is this even appropriate? Is this sacrilegious to ask this? But he finally asked and he said, do pastors ever have bad days where they have doubts about their faith? After I stopped choking on my enchilada, I said, of course. Of course. Yes. There have been plenty of times as a pastor, where, whether, whether it was when I was a pastor or not, I asked myself, what did I accomplish today for the sake of the kingdom of God? And my answer was a resounding, I don't know, or maybe even nothing. I can think of times when I have seen churches hurting or struggling or when I have seen colleagues in ministry struggling and hurting. And I will ask Jesus, Jesus, do you really think that this thing that you created called the church with a capital C is really the best hope for the world? Right? We have our struggles and our doubts and our faith. But friends, for me, when I have those times of questioning and doubting and struggling and wondering how on earth God is working or if God is even working, I remember some of those mountaintop extraordinary moments that I have had in my faith. I think about a time when I was worshiping at an outdoor chapel, just in the midst of God's beautiful creation. And I had this powerful sense, overwhelming sense, not only that, that God was calling me into ministry, but also that God calls every single one of us into ministry, the faith that God has in each of us. I can remember times in my Christian journey when I might have been struggling with something or wrestling with something, and I went to church anyway just because that's what I do, and the pastor would get up and preach, and it was as though God was speaking directly to me and saying what I needed to hear that God saw me and that God cared. I can think of times when members of the body of Christ have shown extravagant love to me or to one another in ways that make visible the love of God that we cannot otherwise see unless we show it to one another. And friends, it's the memory of those times and the anticipation that God has more of those times in store for each of us that gives me faith and strength and perspective to continue through the ordinary and the exciting and the mundane and the doubts and the challenges and the joys and the struggles and everything in between. And friends, I believe the same can be true for every single one of us. We oftentimes talk in church, or at least I oftentimes talk, I talk in church a lot, I guess, but... We oftentimes talk in church about how we have the opportunity to respond 
to what God has first done, to respond to God's grace, to respond uh, to, to God's love by sharing love with others, right? To respond to, to Christ's service by serving others and serving one another. And responding is an incredibly important thing for us to do. It's how our Christian lives take shape and, 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 and become modeled after Jesus Christ himself. But friends, today, before I invite you to respond, I want to invite you to do something different, and that is just to pause. To pause. And just remember one time, one time that you felt the love of God around you in a powerful way. One time when you felt Jesus near to you in a way that you could not begin to put into words and so you didn't even try. One time when you were powerfully aware of the beauty and awe and wonder of God. And then, friends, stand in awe of the truth that in the much more frequent moments when you might not be aware, when you do not feel Jesus near to you in a powerful way, when you aren't overwhelmed by his presence, that Jesus who was transfigured on that mountain long ago, that the very same Jesus who was present with you in whatever moment you thought of in your mind, that that very same Jesus is as near as ever and is as glorious as ever, even in this very moment, right now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we are invited by pausing and taking in the wonder of God and the love and grace of God to respond however God leads us to. You're invited at this time to give back to God God's tithes and your offerings as we respond to God's love and grace in our lives.
us pray. Loving God, we stand in awe of the abundance and the love and grace that you pour out in our lives. We ask that as we return these gifts to you, you would not only use them, but that you would help us appreciate just how good and loving you are. We ask that you would bless all that we have given and all that we have and all that we are so that others might come to know the love and the grace and the glory and the wonder of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 548. Friends, hear now this benediction. Go forth into God's world to be in awe and wonder at the beauty not only of God's creation, but at the beauty of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Look for those glimpses of him where they are to be found. And allow those to carry you through all the places that God calls you to go. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>